thank you very much, President Kwasniewski. You are indeed a great friend, and it's an honor to have you on our board and as a supporter of Concordia. It is with great pleasure that I introduce the former governor of New Jersey, Thomas Keene. While many governors remain defined by domestic issues of their state, Mr. Keene has demonstrated throughout his career an unwavering commitment to national security and a passion for foreign policy. It's, it was this unquestionable investment in our nation's defense and a renowned reputation as a consensus building leader that made him an obvious choice for appointment by President Bush as the chairman of the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States. Given the responsibility of investigating the causes of the first foreign attack on U.S. mainland since the War of 1812, the 9-11 Commission is widely considered one of the most significant independent U.S. government commissions in history. Governor Keene's leadership of the committee and its final report were of tremendous importance in our nation's ability to understand why these atrocities were not prevented by the U.S. government and how we can prevent and defend the United States from future attacks of this kind. As the world looked on, awaiting answers and explanation, Governor Thomas Keene demonstrated unparalleled strength and determination in a time of paralyzing uncertainty. His wealth of knowledge, leadership, and innate ability to create consensus and solutions helped restore confidence in our nation's ability to effectively defend itself. Governor Keene is an undoubtedly powerful voice on the importance of building a confluence between both private and public sectors in the global struggle, in this global struggle. His leadership is one of the most important government commissions in U.S. history, and it was one that defined a new direction of American leadership in the war on terror, and it is an honor, sincere honor, to have him here today. Ladies and gentlemen, Governor Tom Keene. Thank you all very kindly. I'm very nervous today. I've never spoken in between two presidents. <laughs> I'm honored to do so and honored to be here. And we had the job. President Bush and the Congress gave it to us of telling the story. How could this have happened? How could 9-11 have ever happened? And then when we found that out, making recommendations from that story to make sure it never happened again. That's what we tried to do. What we found out is government failed at every single level in the run-up to 9-11, and it was those failures that we documented. But things have changed. Uh, uh, Concordia is such an important thing now because the one thing we've learned is we can never do it alone. This threat involves all of us, all people who love freedom, and unless we act together, uh, we're never going to win this long, long struggle because the terrorist threat has changed. It's evolved. Uh, with the death of Osama uh, and the other senior Al-Qaeda leaders, we don't think they can implement the kind of large-scale attacks that they were before. But they and its affiliates continue to have the intent to reach and kill dozens or even hundreds in a single attack. It's decentralized to the point that the most significant threats come from affiliates of core al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula was responsible for that Christmas Day attempt in 2009 to blow up a plane. A decade ago, we were, we were attacked by terrorists who came from abroad and were able to successfully exploit weaknesses in our border and immigration systems. We've made a lot of progress, as with other countries, in trying to protect our borders, which makes it much more difficult for a foreign terrorist to get into this country. So Al-Qaeda and its affiliates have adopted a new tactic, and that's seeking to recruit American citizens. We used to think in this country that was a European problem. It's not. Uh, there are now a number of Americans who have been recruited on the Internet uh, who want to serve the cause of Al-Qaeda. And that is a very, very difficult problem for us, as for any country. Native-born native people can move around in ways that people from abroad cannot. So it's a great problem. In, in 2009, there were two terrorist attacks on our soil, and they're both by lone wolves. Fort Hood shooting claimed the lives of 13 people, and a U.S. military recruiter was killed in Little Rock, Arkansas. They're influenced by blogs. They're recruited on the Internet. While there is methods to monitor some of this activity because of the nature of the Internet, it is impossible to eradicate it. Online radicalization poses a great threat 
here in the United States and in every country. Let me just go for a few minutes over some of our recommendations that are still not implemented because I think they're important. Uh, things are a lot better off. We are a lot safer in this country, we're a lot safer in this world. But there are still some things that um, we think still needs to be done, need to be done. Still in this country, there are places and a number of major cities that haven't understood, as we have to understand in this world, we have to have, in case of attack, unity of effort. There's got to be somebody in charge. Every city has got to have somebody. It can't be as it was on 9-11 when nobody knew in New York whether the Port Authority, police, or the fire were in charge. Everybody's got to have that kind of a plan. There are too many places in the United States and elsewhere that if there's an emergency, nobody's still quite sure who's in charge. That's got to change. Radios have got to be able to talk to each other here and elsewhere. On 9-11, people died because police and their radios couldn't talk to firemen. The same thing happened when we had Katrina. Still true. The spectrum which we recommended be given to first responders still hasn't been given. So today there are still first responders who cannot talk to each other. If Congress doesn't pass that bill and the President doesn't sign it, people will die next time there's an emergency, mm -hmm. next time there's an attack or an emergency of any kind. Congressional reform. Congressional oversight is intellig of, in of intelligence community is dysfunctional. That word comes from the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, <laughs> not from me. Uh, to give you an example, uh, right now Homeland Security reports to over 100 committees and subcommittees. That's dysfunctional. They spend more time testifying than they do protecting us. Uh, that kind of thing has got to change because if Congress isn't overseeing this correctly, nobody is because intelligence is secret. We can't oversee it the same, same way we can oversee other things. So we need the Congress to improve and to pass some reform. They were very good at reforming the executives. They weren't so good at reforming themselves. We believe uh, that there should be a privacy and civil liberties oversight board. When any country works to protect itself, it does so often by making the government stronger. That's important and often necessary. But at the same time, we've got to make sure the things we're fighting for, particularly our civil liberties, are protected. We recommended, and the Congress passed, a civil liberties board so that when we strengthen government, there's an argument on the other side and a debate on the other side. Uh, that doesn't exist right now. President Obama has yet not, not yet to appoint the members of the board. Uh, we think that should be in place, and we think that's very important to, to protect our liberties. Uh, we believe that your old position, sir, in the DNI, Director of National Security, is a little bit ambiguous in the law. We believe strongly it ought to be strengthened and order eventually have budget, budget oversight as well as appointment powers. We think that will make the fight better over the long term, and we hope that happens. We still haven't got a biometric entry a exit system. Uh, we've got a system where people enter the country but not when they leave. We didn't know in 9-11 that some of the terrorists were still in the country, even though their visas had expired. We need something that does the exit system as well. Uh, we need a standardized secure ID. Congress passed that and said that there should be state driver's license uniform so that nobody can duplicate them. We think that's very important, but Congress keeps putting it off every year, and it's important that be done. When it is, we'll be much more secure. Uh, and the detection system. To be honest with you, even though all that stuff we go through at the airport, the bomb makers are still a little ahead of the detectors. And there are still explosives that even the latest devices you go through at the airport will not detect. So we've got to catch up to that. And we've got to do it. And finally, we've got to have some standards for terrorist detention. For too long, I think our national political leadership has delayed resolving that very difficult, and it's a very, very difficult problem, I won't minimize it, of reconciling the rule of law with indefinitely detaining alleged terrorists, many of whom would do us in in every way they could were they to be released. But nevertheless, Congress and the President must enact into law a comprehensive approach how to handle those detainees that is grounded in the principles of fairness respect for the due process, 
and protecting the American people. Let me say finally that I gave you a very brief, much too brief, but I am very brief. You get much to hear somebody much more important shortly. But the, um, at the whole process I went through, five Republicans and five Democrats in charge of trying to tell this story in a very, very partisan year, charges working together, the whole process gave me, in the end, much more faith in democracy and much more faith in the American system. And let me tell you why. The fact only in a democracy, only in a democracy, could five people of different political persuasion come together on a very difficult and delicate problem and end up agreeing unanimously on ways in which this country's security should be improved. And even more importantly, and I thought this sitting in the White House, we were sitting in the Oval Office at Kennedy, interviewing the President of the United States, and he was saying, any question you have, anything you want to know, and we did that with the President, we did that with the Vice President, with former President Clinton, whereas we didn't hold any office, we were all normal American citizens. Where else in the world, other than a democracy, would we have been allowed to sit there and question the most powerful man in the world with no limits whatsoever? That's what can happen in democracy. That's when people are free. And I was just very privileged to be part of that process. Congratulations on Concordia. It's a wonderful organization.